Welcome to episode two of the Creator Forge podcast. Creator Forge is an educational organization dedicated to offering instructional media focused on how to prepare for work in creative fields in entertainment industries. We engage with experts in fields such as comics, game art, animation, audio, illustration, creative project management, and more to provide diverse views and experiences. Today we're talking to uh, David Riddle. He's a, a lead character artist at High Res Studios right here in Georgia. Uh, they work on the game Smite, and uh, we actually had an in with him because, Pat, you, you know David. I do. He and I have known each other for a few years now. So it, it just made sense. We needed uh, somebody to start out with, someone who was going to gonna go a little easy on us while we uh, work out the kinks in the interview process. And um, yeah, actually it went, went really, really well. Yeah, I, I was really excited. Um, you never know what to expect from e- even yourself when you first get on a microphone, and you <laughs> certainly don't know what to expect from someone else. But David seemed like a natural. Uh, mm-hmm. The microphone didn't seem to uh, intimidate him no, in the just, slightest. He yeah. just sat down, stuck a microphone in his face, and he just started talking. <laughs> he it was, was great. We just kind of yeah. wind him up and let him go. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. Uh, and he answered an awful lot of questions for us about his job at Smite, and also what got him there in the first place, mm-hmm. and what what kind of uh, helped shape him into the artist that he has become in the first place. Yeah, he has a, a quite a varied background, or at least a, a somewhat unusual for someone who's doing, uh, you know, 3D AAA game art now. Mm-hmm. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily ex- expect where he came from, and um, so he has kind of a, a different perspective on a lot of things. Mm-hmm. I love the fact that he has such a variety of different skill sets. And, you know, if if anybody who's listening is interested in ever doing 3D art or working on a game at all, he's got a lot of great advice. And he's also got a lot of great advice on how to break in, how to approach people uh, at game companies, where to approach them, and how to engage with your community so that you can build a network and get in, and uh, and that was. I mean, mm-hmm. we couldn't have asked for more. It, it no. was amazing. And, and there, there are times when it, it um, he gets a little technical because he's mm-hmm. he's a very technically minded artist. He, he is. He's clearly interested in the little the little nitpicky details. Right. Um, but it was better just let him go. And if any of that sparks any interest, and you don't know what he's talking about, um, he keeps dropping you know program names and tool names, and you, you can look it up and and find more. Mm-hmm. But it's it's going to be a great place to start. Absolutely. And then after that, he starts getting into uh, information about his schooling and where he went to school and and what his thoughts on schooling for artists is. And uh, and I think that's something that uh, that I mean, that's our target right there. You know, uh, as Creative Forge, we are looking to figure out. Um, Sorry for the pun, but we are looking to figure out what forges great artists. All right, so uh, let's just, um, enough of us, let's go to the interview. Uh, to, to set the start here, he has just handed me a 3D printed um, thing. And so that's what we're talking about this start. So, okay, so I, I'm genuinely curious. So we've got this. So it's a, black. okay, so the 3D printer is called an SLA printer. And uh, typically you have what are called FDM printers. And an FDM is a, like a hot glue gun. And so you have okay. a weed whacker spool of plastic that feeds into the FDM, right, and it squeezes it out onto a little tray. Uh, mine is a vat of liquid goo, and there's a laser underneath the liquid oh, goo. Oh, oh okay, 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 I've seen that. Like, <laughs> and it cures layer at a time. My immediate response is like the fifth element. Yeah, well, or like uh, Terminator, where they have the hand coming out yep, of the goo. there you go. <laughs> it, it is exactly like this. This was hanging upside down from the ceiling as it pulled itself out of the wow. goo. Uh, and because of that, this can be much higher resolution than I was going to say, it's really smooth. It doesn't have that... Um... I did sand it. Oh, okay. Well, good. But, but right. it's, you know, even with the sanding, it, it doesn't need much. Um, yeah, you and then I filled the back rough. with resin. Like, I poured an extra... Okay, so so you, you basically... That was, like, hollow. It's like paper what? thin. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So... I want to print stuff now. So what, what we're looking at here is a pair of, I would say, um, one half scale It's full human. scale. What? This is full oh, scale. Come on. It must be a child. It's, yeah, but that's very small. Look at my lips. 
I'm sorry. Your no, lips, it's the you're same very size. Small, so. No, yeah, same, I'm sorry. No, it's actually wider than my lips. I don't care. It looks small compared to your face. Look at that. All right. What we've got here is about two thirds. <laughs> I think it's full scale. <laughs> two thirds. I measured scale, it. Two thirds scale human lips. It's ladies' lips. I, all right. <laughs> two thirds scale child lips, um, uh, or young adult lips, and uh, and it is just a really smooth, beautiful 3D print of human lips. And he turned it upside down and put some resin in it to fill it up and make it a solid piece. And it is just uh, really beautifully rendered. That's that's actually that'd be great reference to have just sitting on your desk. No, nope, yeah, I'm sure oh it's probably. God. So I'll, I'll do that. Can I? Can I? Can I have some? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I could. I could definitely print a. Or actually, I'm going to cast it a bunch. Like, how would the? Um, oh, oh, well, here's a, here's a relevant question. How how much uh, material? How much is the cost of the material? The amount of the material that's in. So this? on the printer, the printer is a hundred and fifty dollars a bottle, and it's like a liter bottle. Mm -hmm. So I could maybe get twenty to thirty of those out of one hundred and fifty. Uh, so it's, it's pricier than normal, like resin casting, but so something like five or $6 each, probably. something like that. And then after that's, filling it with resin not and bad. doing a, if he gets 20, cast. okay, well I was doing 30, I was, yeah. I was shooting for the yeah, yeah, yeah. optimistic number, but yeah. yeah, okay. The point is it's <laughs> yeah. less than 10 bucks. That's actually not yeah. bad. Yeah. yeah not that's, bad. that's great. Uh, if you order anything, you know, 3d printed from places, you're, you're going to pay three times that, you know, oh, yeah. well, which sure. makes sense. Cause of course there's someone else they, doing well, yeah. the work and they're shipping. Well, they and then ship you got to make yeah. the mold and all that kind of stuff too, probably. Yeah. Cause typically you wouldn't want to send them the, the actual cast out of the printer. You would want to make a mold of it, which is what I'm going to do. I'm actually building all of these to do. Um, I'm going to test photorealism outside of the computer. So I've done an eyeball, I've done an ear, and I've done the mouth, and I'm going to do a nose. And Can you clarify for me what you mean by photo real? Because when I think of photo, I think of a, a flat uh, thing printed on a piece of paper. Well, I guess hyper-realistic would okay. be a, a good term. So you look at it, and it looks like a person's face. Mm -hmm. So it has the same subsurface scattering in the ears and then the nose and the face, the same kind of texturing, color, so kind of like what you'll, what you'll find at like Madame Tussauds or something like that. Yeah, well, uh, I'm actually looking at uh, one of my favorite artists is uh, Ron Muick, and um, he's pretty much what I'm going to be going for in the end. Maybe, mm. maybe a little bit better if I can. <laughs> so, okay, hopefully, oh, it Ron Muick. I'm going to have to look him up again. But yeah, that that's a oh right. oh the guy does a really really oversized people right yeah okay. he does he does oversized and undersized very tiny tiny work which is wow. very interesting so I want to play with that kind of stuff but I may yeah, the I might person in the bed is super push it creepy. in yes he does some weird stuff uh, I might push it in a different direction though I'm not gonna do actual people I don't think how um, how would how would you wait a minute. I'm just trying to think of that in real life. So the materials have got to be pretty interesting. So I'm that, guessing some sort of uh, s s translucent resin, and I'll probably <laughs> uh, add some sort of red color to the translucent mm -hmm. resin, and that'll be my base. And then I'll probably paint over top of that with lacquers to get um, the skin texture and the specularity that I want. I'll probably have to... What what made you decide you wanted to? I know you and I kind of talked about this. That last does weekend, seem kind of kind of out there. Kinda <laughs> out there. You know, I have a three D printer. You know what I'm going to do? <laughs> well, it, it's like I've always liked doing it in the computer already, uh, mm -hmm. but doing it in the computer takes months. Doing a photorealism like a, a face, and and sitting in the front of a computer when you have a wife at home is not a not a good way to have a good relationship. So working on a sculpture that's in front of you, it's a little <laughs> bit better because I could sit near her and like actually talk to her and watch TV with her. And so, oh, that's an interesting, that's an interesting take. Yeah, it's kind of like out of necessity. <laughs> hmm. A, hey, uh, I'm getting a photograph. <laughs> <laughs> we needed we needed a picture of you for the for the website <laughs> for right? the podcast, right? <laughs> we already talked about that. What we're gonna put like on the website, like in the show notes and stuff. There you go. I was thinking we we gotta have like a little, just a mini bio <laughs> and the picture. Yeah, at least yeah, at least a absolutely. picture. Um, probably a few examples of of work. I'm sure you have something you can. Oh yeah, uh, you just look up Smite. And you get, <laughs> get a whole shit ton of stuff. That does make it easier. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, perfect segue. 
Um, how long have you been working at high res? And I, you just said Smite. Is that the only game that you've been working on since you started high res? So I've been at high res for five and a half years now total. Wow. Um, I've been on Smite most of the time. There was another game that we started and it, it, uh, got shut down, but that was like a six month period out of, uh, five and a half years. Can you, can you talk about that at all? Uh, it's kind of been appropriated for Paladins, at least the, um, the workings of it, but it's, pr- it's gone. There's no, there's no game anymore. Hmm. So I had all the characters. <sighs> <laughs> oh, well, it just happens. Like if, if games aren't feeling right, they just shut it down. And right. we've, we've gone through like six or seven, like probably like $700,000 like ventures where they just like shut it down and it's because it's, they can tell right away if it's going to do well or not not do well. And, (laughs) you know, playing it a little while and they're like, okay, this is fun, but it's not going to make money. And then they just shut it down and it it makes sense. Like Mm -hmm. you wouldn't want to push forward and, you know, sink 20, 20 million in a, in a game that's not worth sinking it into. So Mm -hmm. good point. Yeah. Did, uh, how did that feel though when they shut it down? I mean, Oh, it's always tough. Yeah. Especially when you're new, because that was probably the second year I was there. Um, and uh, that can just make it really hard to to want to do art for a while. <laughs> you're, you're not used to that feeling of, yeah. of the commerce Losing side of it. stuff. Yeah. So. Mm. so tell us a little bit about... Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to ask what exactly your position there is. Like, I think I know, but we should at least say it. So I'm a senior character artist at hi and I've been a senior for only a couple months now. Hmm. But uh, been four years of just plain old character artist. What does a senior character artist do? So the only real difference between a character artist and a senior character artist is if they need help uh, teaching people, wrangling people to do the right thing when they're not doing the right thing. Um, I did do a little bit of contracting for the, the studio or helped contractors. So I would contact people outside of the studio. And then we did 3D modeling through a, a company called Liquid. And they would uh, send us their models and their textures and that kind of stuff. And then I would have to get it in game or I'd have to tell them, hey, this is messed up looking. You need to fix that. You know, kind of more senior kind of things. And then that fell off because we wanted to move it all in-house mm-hmm. instead of having it spread out wherever and not knowing when it was going to come in and all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's much better. We've just hired more people. I think we have like 17 character artists now. Wow. Yeah. I was going to say high has gone through quite a uh, growth it's spurt huge. last couple of years, right? It's huge. So when I first started, there was 45 people and I knew every single person in the studio. And now we're up to almost 300. Wow. And they're talking about, a lot more people, so. Well, I think, what, what was the number? Something like 70 job listings right now. I believe it, the yeah. The number I keep, I keep uh, yeah. seeing thrown around. I believe it. I haven't looked in a while. and But, uh, you know, we, we hire character artists all the time. Like We we find their resumes online, and if, if they're good, uh, usually not resume, portfolio. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we don't, we don't even look at resume anymore. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Who cares who, where they went to school? I was going like, to say, who cares where you went matter. to school? Who cares where you work? Show us your work. Exactly. Show us what you can actually do yeah. for us. Yeah. yeah and, then, and then sometimes if they're like on the cusp, we'll have them do uh, uh, our test mm-hmm. and they get like a month to do it. And then, which is like typical character time. That's how long mm-hmm. I usually have per character, which is about right. It's not, it's not too fast or too slow, which is nice because a lot of studios rush things. Or mm-hmm. they're the exact opposite. They give you way too much time. And Wait, what's that principle that's bad. you keep talking about? Where uh, it, uh, uh, the work t- it takes to achieve a certain goal will expand to the time you're given to do it? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. I, I can never remember the I think it's either Park's Law or Parkins, Parkins Law, Parkinson's Law, or something like that. I'm going to have to look it up. We'll, we'll put a link into yeah. uh, mm-hmm. the show There's notes. something to that. I mean, you don't want to shortchange it, obviously, yeah. because there is a lot of work that goes into that if you want quality. But... You know, if you can do it in a month, they'll give them three because they will take yeah. three. Oh, yeah. And, and it'll probably, probably not be, be not done. as good as yeah. the month would have Right, been. because you, you, you get past a, a point of 
uh, where you're inspired and, and motivated when you're putting too much time into something that can take a shorter amount of time. I'm totally guilty of exactly that. Or you that. overwork so it. Way too much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You sit there like like finagling over little mm-hmm. tiny details and, and it starts feeling like something that somebody's just like petted. So, yeah. On that note, tell us just a little bit more about what you do as specifically a character artist. You've told us kind of what you do as a senior character artist. What does a character artist do at high res and I assume in the rest of the video game industry? Yep. Um, So we get a concept from concepting team and it's usually just a uh, like a three quarter straight on, maybe the character's posed in slightly, but you can see every part of the character. So they're not doing orthos or turnarounds for you anymore? No. Uh, and oh. we'll maybe get a back view uh, if, if we need it. Um, and then we start on that. So what I do is I get to a rough within about a week. And so depending on what tier the character is, the rough will be different. So if I'm making a god, yeah, I can just do whatever I want. I just any scale size, whatever I feel like making, as long as the proportions look like what the concept is and is feeling good, I can I can continue in that direction without asking anybody any questions. But if we uh, do skins, then you have a lot of times where it has to fit a rig. What's a skin? So a skin is like a a variant of what the character is. So you have like Zeus, but you have. Um, Zeus is like the uh, Captain America or whatever. You know, he just <laughs> he looks like something completely different. Right. And that's what a skin is. And mm-hmm. depending on how different the skins are, they have tier classifications. So tier w- one is uh, just a color variant. So you just change the color, which doesn't take much work. Mm-hmm. But uh, nonetheless, you get a new texture, and that takes up memory in the computer and you know, is a download size and that kind of thing. So it's worth something. Mm-hmm. Um, but a tier two, they change a little bit of the model. So it's not only a texture change, but now it's like some of the geo changes and some of the textures are different shapes and different. So I'm talking like, like different, uh, different accessories, different clothing, exactly. different hair, stuff like yeah, that. Exactly. Okay. So you have like different armor on Zeus, mm-hmm. whatever. Like he has a different looking shield, uh, maybe a short hair instead of long hair. Uh, and then a tier three is a complete character change, but on the same rig. So you're having to follow the exact rig so that animation doesn't get broken, uh, but the look is completely different. It can be whatever. So Zeus could be a, a really young man this time, and now he's like a, a fisherman. <laughs> it could be random, really random, um, mm-hmm. as long as it doesn't break the rig. And then uh, tier four and above, it can start breaking that rig. So. Okay, and, and just to be clear, um, I've done three D modeling and stuff. But um, for anyone who hasn't, the rig essentially equates to like the skeleton of the character. Yep. It's, it's the bones that it's move the, the character puppetry. around. It's the puppetry. It allows it to move around. Exactly. So if, if you know you start with Zeus, I'm, I'm assuming <laughs> is a, you know that kind of a character would be you know broad shoulders, barrel chested, yep. you know big arms, all that. You can't put a, a skinny, a skinny character person. with you know exactly. sloped shoulders on that because the yep. the, the rig the, the skeleton is literally too big for it. that. Or yeah, yep. okay, definitely. And and also just to be clear, the model when you say models or polys or geo, that all, all the same thing. It all refers <laughs> to the same thing, which yep. is sculpture <laughs> and it, 3D modeling and that you do in what, what I program. Do. Yeah. Uh, well, I use multiple programs, so at any one time, I'm probably working in ten different programs. Holy crap! Um, well, that actually that would lead into a, a question: is what what is your workflow when if you're given a okay. concept and let's say yeah. you can just yeah so the, the best possible scenario you can do whatever you want with it. What what so what for a your... god, I start with the concept and then I make a rough, and what that allows uh, rigging to do is start placing the bones. So I hand them off uh, what's called either decimated geo, which you just take your uh, high poly and you uh, put it through a program that eats the polygons. And it brings it down from like two million down to like thirty thousand, but it's all triangulated, nasty garbage. Uh, and then you send that off to rigging, and they can start placing bones. But a lot of times, what I do is I throw the character into a program called Topo Gun, mm-hmm. and it'll be high poly in Topo Gun. But what I'll do is I'll draw out polygons because Topo Gun allows you to snap vertices to a high poly mesh. And so when you're when you're 
replacing the verts, you can actually make a much lower polygon mesh that's skinned over top of the high poly. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, then I'll send that to them, and it's actually animatable, where the decimated is not. It's very yeah. trashy, but it can still be useful, so I'll, ha I'll hand off both, because sometimes the... Uh, topo gun version you lose a lot of where the joints are because mm -hmm. it's very smooth and clean topology versus very high polygon content where the decimated version looks like the sculpture still right so they so, can find those joints and mm -hmm. everything easy so for the original sculpture the original high poly version uh, i'm assuming something like uh, zbrush or definitely that's the only program i sculpt in um now, a lot of people do uh, like a mixture of doing high poly parts inside of Max or Maya or whatever. Uh, our, our company uses Max, but, and, but myself, I actually do all of the hard surface and all of the uh, organic all within ZBrush just because I'm a traditional sculptor and mm -hmm. coming to ZBrush just made it easy. I didn't, I didn't have to worry about it. Uh, a lot of people get hung up on making very precise, clean edges inside of Max. And, and I feel like ZBrush can do that and just as easy, but with sculpting tools, you can just use um, H polish or trim dynamic and actually like make a clean, beautiful curve that Max would do with, you know, vertice, 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 and then you smooth it and it would interpolate the in between. Um, <laughs> But that, that's how I start out doing a, uh, a rough is I just get them something quick so that they have it and they can start messing around with it. And then at that point, I have uh, about a week and a half to do a high poly. And so I make it look exactly like the uh, concept and try to go better if I can. Mm -hmm. So I try to take every best piece inside of the concept and emphasize it times 10 if I can. And then at the very end of that, I have a high poly I probably color it inside of ZBrush. I use a, a thing called poly painting. Mm -hmm. And um, that's essentially every vertice that's on the character will put out a color, any color. And you can paint within ZBrush on all of that. And so if you have like 20, 30 million polys, that's a lot of points for painting. It's like way more than what Photoshop could handle. Um, and so you paint that and there's... Again, in Topo Gun, you can convert that onto the low poly eventually. And uh, after the high poly, then you got to make a low. Mm -hmm. uh, and then as you're making that low, you take pieces of the high poly into Topo Gun and make a skin again of those pieces, bring it into Max, and then you do what's called UVing. Mm -hmm. And once you've got all the pieces, you UV all the pieces and you pack it. And it has to fit within a one by one square inside of the UV editor. And we, uh, we use a 1024 in game mm -hmm. is our size of texture. Uh, and so we pack the shit out of things. Like it is, it's packed beyond a pixel. It sometimes things are touching. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was going to say they're, they're fairly detailed models and, and yeah. textures. So yeah, yeah. for a, for a 1k image that or 1k and uh, the weapons texture on there map. too. Oh, oh God. Okay. Yeah. So if, if they have a weapon, it's on there. Uh, it's just one, one K. Uh, we do authorize at 2048 20, so that uh, if there was like a rendering that we needed to do of the character, they could mm -hmm. do it. But in game, it's 1024 always, except for maybe the Xbox. We'll see. Uh, they're, they're having the new Xbox come out pretty soon, the, the high resolution one. Yeah. It, so I, don't we'll know, see. I don't know what they're called anymore. We'll the, see if we the one that does upgrade yeah. for that. It's possible. Hmm. And then after uh, UVing, then I got a texture. Uh, and you do all the 1K maps. So you have a, uh, a normal map, which is essentially, it's a bump map that, uh, well, if you don't know. What, <laughs> what is a bump map? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm watching so, uh, Pat's eyes glaze over a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Uh, it's very technical. The, the whole thing took me years to, to figure out. Um, and there's going to be tons of people out there who at least can can hook onto what you're talking about. So don't they don't, should be able to find let, well yeah. with, and the name should help like Topo Gun and ZBrush right. Max mm -hmm. 3D Max Studio. But now I do know what a normal map is, but I don't know if our younger listeners do know what that is. So, so. technically, what a normal map does is it takes the lighting information from the scene and it 
It also takes the high poly information and it conveys what the light would do interacting with a high poly surface on a low poly object. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is faking high resolution mm -hmm. on low resolution. Okay. Now that, that, that's, that's, uh, that's a little, that's a little And better. it's all funny colors. And if you get funny colors, you know, you did it right. As long as it's uh, mostly blue. Uh -huh. uh, mm -hmm. If you're getting multicolor like greens and reds and all that kind of stuff, it's called an object space map and you've screwed up. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, so so now I, I, I also know what a texture is, but I mean, when I think of texture, I think of something completely different than what a texture map is. So uh, you mentioned texture maps earlier. Tell, so tell me about that. I know when, that you actually do the painting on some of yes, those on your definitely. own characters so as well. So you do it all inside of Photoshop. Well, you can do it in lots of programs, but I, I do mostly my poly paint, which I convert that over to a Photoshop file. Uh, so you get that color from ZBrush and you can convert it into a 2D image, which is the texture. So the texture is just a coordinate system that is telling you where your color is being mapped onto the 3D object. Okay. And so... And we, now describe to me what it looks like once you get it into a it Photoshop It looks like a file. filleted human. Okay, there you go. That's what it looks <laughs> like. Definitely. Yeah, well, there's, there's a reason That's what... what it um, is. Uh, another word for like UV mapping or, or some of the tools is referred to as pelting. It Definitely. Kind of, oh, cool. Yeah, no, that, only... that is a term that's get thrown around. And it actually is very descriptive because it's almost as if you yep. took whatever you have, and you're sliced it. it open and just laid it flat. Yep. Right. And literally and looks, in Max, that is one of the main tools I use is pelting. It, it looks mm -hmm. super creepy. It's and two clicks. Yeah. Wow. That's two clicks. So I peel the pieces off. So I have two separate pieces. And then I hit pelt on both. And then I hit relax on both, and that's it. And so that that those two things flatten it out, and then create a file that you can import to Photoshop, so that you can digitally paint yep. as if yep. it's a as if you've taken someone's skin off their body, flattened it out, and <laughs> painting it. Yep. Yep. But it but digitally here. I know this yes. all sounds creepy, but it's very. Uh, that's exactly what it is. It's very um, necessary. So. And with Unreal Three and Unreal Four slightly. Uh, there is a lot of um, adding in that you have to do. Like it doesn't, like you can't just do flat colors. That won't work because mm -hmm. the lighting inside of the program isn't perfect. And so you have to add in a lot of shadows. You have to add in um, bounce lights. You have to add in um, cavities and highlights on the edges, the like scratches, the dings, the dents. All that stuff is painted by hand. So you're saying um, doing that less with, with Unreal 4, is that because it's uh, it does more uh, physically-based lighting? Yes. So the, the physically-based render makes uh, the materials much better now. Mm -hmm. uh, you get a lot of the bounce light. You get a lot of uh, what's called global illumination. Um, you get a lot of uh, cavity and AO inside of Unreal 4, but it... It's still not perfect, so you have to put a little bit in, but it's probably like 70% less than what we do. And uh, we do lots of tricky little things, like um, we do gradients from each piece to the next, so there's never a hard edge from a polygon mm -hmm. to a polygon. Um, and we use AO, but it's not black. We never do black AO. We add in blue to the darks and yellow to the highlights, and then that way it's like always making it better looking and yeah. less uh, flat. So Pat, I'm waiting for you to ask what AO means. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Ambient occlusion. Ambient occlusion. So now, it, what is it, that? <laughs> it means uh, any surface that's nearing another surface. Okay. So if you have like a, uh, like a, like a valley or like a, like a dip that's coming into a, a point inside of that point, it's going to shade out black and it's going to gradiate outward from that point. So are you talking about like an armpit or something? I mean, exactly. I, okay. Exactly. No, actually, exactly. Okay. Yeah. I think, think of like folds and clothing. There'll, there'll be a little dark bit there. So think that kind of thing. on the, on the, on the peaks, it's white. Mm -hmm. And in the valleys, it's black. Cause see, I, I know what occlusion is. I've never in, in traditional art, I guess I've never heard the terms ambient occlusion. Um, and for that matter, uh, until I got into uh, the, I got involved somewhat in the process of creating concept art and, and even traditional art that wound up somehow or another having to do with the 3D process at work. 
I, I had no idea what the word specularity meant as oh, yeah. it, as oh, as yeah. it as <laughs> it's referring to rendering out a 3D object. Unfortunately, a lot of 3D artists don't either. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't we, say that. we use a colored spec. Um, <laughs> All right, and this is great stuff. Here's what I want you to do for me, <laughs> if you can, if you can. <laughs> In an absolute layman's term nutshell, for somebody who has never been involved in 3D art but but is thinking about it, what do you do? Like I, I now understand everything that you just told me, mostly, but but give me that nutshell. So I sculpt, I paint, I draw... I mess around with materials. I make like metal, I make cloth, I make uh, skin, all of those. And in the computer, in the computer, all mm -hmm. of it. And I use Unreal 3 right now, but mm -hmm. we'll probably upgrade to Unreal 4 pretty soon and, and it'll be even better. Unreal, of course, is a game engine for anybody that doesn't engine. know. And that yep. is the a game engine also, by the way, is a piece of software that runs a game, right? Yep. It's it's basically the operating system of a game. Yep. And which, by the way, until I started working my current job, had no clue what Unity was or Unreal or any of that stuff. And that's the again, I'm 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 bringing in the layman side of this here because yeah. in, in terms of the three of us right now, I'm definitely that guy. Um, so you do all the things that you just mentioned in order to get a character that's playable into Smite, yes. which is your current yeah. your current thing. Awesome. And like ninety percent of that is self taught. <laughs> okay, now now that's we're gonna have to part. talk about the education side of this. <laughs> all right. So yeah. yeah, you gotta find that stuff online. That's it. That's that's a whole story. <laughs> So are you saying that your your um how many years of education were worthless? No, I'm not saying it was worthless. Uh I wouldn't say that it was great either. Um SCAD doesn't do a good job of actually teaching what you need to know in the industry, I think. Hmm. So it's like they give you a whole bunch of information, but none of it is actually like pointed at anything okay mm -hmm. and they tell you to have this like portfolio that's really vast and has all kinds of things in it when when we're hiring we want one thing really that's it and that's the only thing that you're wanting to be hired for is what we want on your portfolio mm -hmm. like if you have environment stuff and it it you're only is as bad as your worst piece okay and if you're showing your worst piece on there that's an indication that you don't understand how bad it is and we right. won't mm -hmm. hire you because of it. Um, so ju just to be clear, yeah. though, how many people work at high res There's around 300, I think. So in our art department at, um, at, at the company that we work at, there's 25 people or something like that, and they actually are looking for that absolute generalist when it comes to yeah. uh, 3D yeah, definitely. and so forth. So yeah. there's th just to be clear, there are different levels of it. But you're saying that SCAD well, there's very wasn't... very different products involved. Right. Very different needs. You have a, a large right. company that is, that is rapidly expanding and yeah. creating large, complex games. We're expanding too, but, but we're, making, we're making small games yeah. many times over as opposed to, you know. Right. So, Skad, um, <laughs> you did get your master's degree at Skad, yes, right? Yes, I have my master's. Uh, I can teach, <laughs> which is good. That'll that'll be good. Yeah, I was going to ask why. Uh, is it was it was there an idea? Uh, I mean, the teaching teaching? Would, teaching would be nice. So, and eventually, like after all of this uh, stress and and hard work, Amber and I would probably want to go to Skad and and actually like teach there for a while. So, I, I think that'd be fun. Like mm -hmm. actually Savannah, not not here in Atlanta. I don't think that would be very. Eh. <laughs> I get tired of the traffic, so. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, because I was going to wonder because a, a lot of um, most art careers that, that I'm aware of, the masters do, it seems like kind of dubious what it gets you unless yeah, you yeah. want to teach or yeah. or you're you really just want to aim at like the the top end of jobs. But even then, it seems like it'd be better to take that two or three years and. Just get a job. Yeah. You know? yeah. And work on your chops. Well, and it, and it exactly. took me a whole year to get in the industry, too. So mm -hmm. that's uh, definitely... I, I remember. I, I mean, I, I, I had just met you, I think, when you had re relatively recently gotten out of yeah. SCAD. Yeah. 
I was working. So Amber was working at uh, Carter's already, and it took me a, a full year after she had started at Carter's. So we were living in 660 um, Midtown. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it's in the old Fourth Ward. It's kind of kind of a scary place. Uh, it isn't now. It's nice now. Um, it was then. Uh, and yet also expensive, I'm sure. It was expensive. Yeah. And <laughs> Anywhere mid So that whole time yeah. during the whole year, I was just making a portfolio. And I, I think I made six portfolios while I was at home. And luckily, my parents were helping us out a little bit. So I got, mm-hmm. I got to work on it. But I, I think I made like 15 or 20 characters in a year. So mm-hmm. it was way more than I even make now. And I was mm-hmm. I was just crunching every day, nine hours, 10 hours a day, just trying to get in. <laughs> So you're saying six por- like different portfolios for different kinds of work? No, no, it was most of them were all character art. I just mm-hmm. I would make one and I'd be like, it's not, it's not ready. Like I'd start looking at what was already mm-hmm. in the industry, and uh, then I would be like, okay, I gotta, I gotta do more characters. I, and so I'd do like three characters, shut that portfolio down. Do more three, three more characters, shut that one down. So I kept going through it, and the last one. Um, I had three characters, and I contacted. There was a intern at the time at Hyras, and he's he's one of our. I think he's a senior. Um, he's an animator there, uh, Leandro. He's awesome, like incredible artist. Uh, and I, I contacted him. I was like, "Hey, uh, you went to SCAD too, man? Right? <laughs> uh, could you show my portfolio?" And he he was like. Luckily, he was like, "Oh yeah, I'll show it off to my lead, which was uh, Dan um, Daniel." Uh, and so he sent that to Daniel, and I guess Daniel right away sent it to Jerry, which was our art director at the time. Mm-hmm. And that day, I got a call, so that nice. was the start of it. But nice, nice. Well, I so said that that's the best way to do it is to have, to know somebody who's already yeah. there who can. Yeah. They're not going to get you the job, but they might put your portfolio on the top of the pile. Or yeah, whatever. well, and it was crazy. I got I got in as a unpaid intern Ooh. for four months, and after that, I got to be a contract artist for six months, and it was, I mean, it, it was just awesome to be able to get in. So, but when you when you first got there, how many how many employees were there? I mean, this was, was forty five. Very we were, new company. We were down to forty five. Yeah, so that was. I mean, it was a and completely it was actually different down animal. Down to forty five. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, Hyrus has actually been around probably longer than you might realize, but it was, they, they it was opened in downs. 2004. Mm-hmm. When I graduated high school, they started uh, Hyrus. Wow. And then six years later, I contacted <laughs> right or more. Uh, and so um, they were at 45, and within two years, we were up to like 150, and now it's up to like 280 or something crazy. It's I don't know anybody. Which is weird, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, you know. Seeing ninety percent of the people walking through the hallway and not knowing who they are anymore—strange. Um, and that—that that is mostly due to Smite, right? Yes, yeah. Smite is probably the only reason right now. Um, Paladins is doing really well, though, so that's that's a good thing. We're mm-hmm. actually gearing up on it, so it should start to uh, get really big here soon. You said earlier that you have a traditional sculpture background. Yes. Uh, you want to tell us about that a little bit? Sure. Um, I've been doing art since I was little, very little. <laughs> uh, drawing, painting, uh, did a lot of oil painting when I was young. Um, a lot of traditional sculpture. Uh, when Wait, I was, f- how, how, I'm sorry. How how young oil painting? How young? Uh, it's probably 11, 12 when my parents started. How do you get into me. oil painting <laughs> yeah. at that age? Cause yeah, I loved it. Uh, I just that's... tried everything. Like, wow. Literally, I, any kind of art, I tried it. I airbrush, uh, sculpture. We did. I met a guy uh, that was teaching classes for sculpture outside of actual class. So he was teaching me uh, how to use the brown victory wax, which is it's like this sticky black goo. And uh, starts out really hard, but as you work with it, it gets even more sticky and even more nasty, and it doesn't really hold to armatures very well. Sounds great. Yeah, it, it, it's what traditional artists used to use back when uh, they first started doing bronzes, like mm. like Greek and Roman times is what Victory Brown Wax is from. Um, it's messy. It's nasty. And you put it in a crock pot to get it soft, 
and it becomes boily hot lava, which is not good. So you try to smear that on something with your hands, and you have napalm fingers. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I messed with that quite a while, uh, and then I went to a bronzing convention in Loveland, Colorado, which is where I'm from. And uh, I'm sorry, I, I just love that. That's it's a crazy. Thing. It, well, it's crazy. It's it's literally the largest bronzing convention in the world, and there's probably about uh, 300 artists that go there. And there's like 15 foot tall sculptures that are made out of bronze. How it's, old were you when you first when you went to that? So that was uh, around 14 or 15. And then you're, um, you're from Colorado, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I live in uh, Colorado Springs, or lived in Colorado Springs. Um, Do you have to be a bronzing artist to go to one of these, no, or can you just go uh, to Gawk? You can you can go to Gawk. That's what I'm. I did. I'm, uh, I'm sensing a road trip here. <laughs> it's it's amazing. Um, it happens every year. I think it's like August. Um, but it's this huge convention, people making like multi million dollar bronzes and and wow. showing them off to everybody. And when I was there, I fi- figured out how to, or learned a new type of sculpting medium, and it was a uh, chavant. Mm-hmm. And from then on, that's what I used and still use is chavant uh, traditionally. And what chavant? It is a plasticine, a uh, Non-sulfurated plasticine is what it's called. Okay, well, what, that clears it up. That just clears it right up. What, so what does that mean? It is a clay that never dries out. Ah. It's, uh, it, it feels like tacky rubber almost, mm-hmm. uh, but it's very smooth and very uh, easy to sculpt with. And you, you have okay. to heat that up in order to work with it, right? You So there's different uh, hardnesses, and the hard is like a rock, and you definitely have to eat it. Um, medium, you don't really have to heat that much. Hmm. You can work with it barehanded. Uh, and then the soft is very soft. Like mm-hmm. you can just take your whole hand and take chunks out of it with, but, uh, all three of them are very lightweight. They have a very soft density to them and they're very tough at the same time. So they don't need a whole lot of armature, which is really nice where that victory brown wax was like mm-hmm. heavy in like wouldn't even stick to the armature and it would slowly slide off of it and it was just evil to work with. So so when you're done if you, if you heat it up to soften it um w- when you're done how do you how do you set it? So it never sets. Uh oh. you make a mold of it and then you cast from that mold. Um but it it will melt. And so you can do uh, what's called the um lost wax technique and that that essentially is so when you do bronzes and for this is the same technique that was done two thousand years ago. Uh, mm. They take the wax uh, sculpture and they cover it in clay, like a, a fairly strong clay, and then they uh, heat the entire thing up and melt out the wax. Oh, and okay. so you get a negative inside. And so that that sets the clay while removing exactly. the original sculpture. Yeah. So it makes it. Uh, what they called uh, vitrified is what the the word for the which is something else I learned. So when I went to college after all of this, I went and studied as a potter. Um, anyways, so you you have the vitrified uh, ceramic, and then they pour the hot metal into it. But because it's not um, stone temperature, like stone um, quality, the vitrified pour or clay will s- crack and bust. Mm-hmm. And so the instant that the uh, metal hits it, it cools enough that it holds its shape, and then the ceramic starts to flake off. Hmm. And so you That's really instantly cool. get a sculpture, and you just bust <clears throat> off the ceramic and then clean it with little dental tools and that kind of stuff. Wow. And slice off the, the tubes. Have you ever done bronzing? Yes. I mean, you've, so you've done actual, you've, yeah. you've actually used the lost wax technique. Yeah. I, and, I didn't do it myself. Bronzes. So, uh, when I was in high school, they uh, contracted me to do the scorpion for the mascot for the high school. Lovely and mascot. Yeah, it's actually kind of That's cool. a cool mascot. Yeah, it was we, super cool. So you got contracted <laughs> to do that, and then did you get to see the process happen when they actually so uh, I didn't see it? mine happen, but mm. I got to see the entire process. They mm-hmm. took me through the entire thing, what they were going to do to my uh, sculpture. And uh, I have the mold still at home, so I could I could make it at any point. I don't know why I would. It's, it's so old, the... Uh, I would just make a new one. Yeah. Um, anyways, I so they 
take you into the place and they show you how they do the, the new way that they do the, the clay is really amazing. They have like a pool of liquid ceramic and they dunk repeatedly the sculpture into the ceramic dunk, 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 dunk until it starts getting a film of it and it gets grow. It grows slowly and gets thicker and thicker and thicker until it's the thick enough that it can make it. And they put it in a kiln really quick and uh, it turns it to that vitrified state, which is, it's not porcelain, but it's also not um, clay. Mm-hmm. And I learned all this in when I was in college, uh, undergrad. Okay. So I was we, a potter. where did you go to undergrad? I went to CSU Pueblo, Colorado. And uh, they have an amazing pottery studio there. Uh, Vicki Hansen runs it, and she's incredible. She studied under famous Japanese artists, and she... Is she still there? Yeah, and she throws amazing, just absolutely perfect thrower. Um, Throw, uh, throwing uh, pottery. Throwing pottery. <laughs> and so now, I know we're kind of jumping around a little bit, but just to clarify the chronology, you first got into drawing, painting, sculpture at, how how old did you say you were? Uh, forever. Forever. <laughs> but, I mean, do you remember at all what got you into it at all, or was it just something you just... I just always you, wanted to You came it. out of the womb with a pencil in your hand and you started drawing. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't, you don't even know. Yeah. I, I never liked crayons. Uh, I don't know what about them. They, mm. they felt too inaccurate, maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, always you, hated crayons. Did you like? I mean, did you like Pencils. comic books or something? I mean, oh, what, definitely what, like what comic got you books. into visuals? What 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 motivated loved you? Comic books. Uh, loved movies. Um, saw Jurassic Park, and really, uh, Jurassic Park is why I got into 3D. And I I didn't know what 3D was until I was about 16. And um, again, the same guy that showed me the brown victory wax also showed me a, a, his first finding of a 3D program. And then at the same time that he found Maya, I found Maya on my own. Mm-hmm. And I got, uh, we didn't talk to each other for like two years. And then two years later when I was like 17, uh, he contacted me again just to say hi. And we were both like, oh, you tried Maya? And he had tried mm-hmm. Maya and he had bought it, like actually bought it. And I had the student edition and um, so then we, we started talking to each other again. His name is Chris Gilman. Um, and I really, at that point, I uh, started going to 3D heavily. Um, and that was right at the end of high school. And my parents told me that if I didn't get a job, I had to f- do something constructive all summer. Mm-hmm. And so I stayed home and was on my G4 Macintosh tower for 18 hours a day straight Mm -hmm. every day uh learning 3d and so i learned maya i learned um body paint uh zbrush topo gun no a topo gun was later um and your your folks were cool with that being your replacement for a job yeah so that was training myself to do something uh constructive and better and then i went to college and i would do that every summer during college too uh and during college, I brought it there for every once in a while, the tower, and would work like at night with it and, you know, four in the morning. <laughs> uh, and then after college, uh, Amber and I found SCAD, and they were actually like... I'm sorry, worked. Am- Amber? Amber's my wife. Ah. So, uh, girlfriend at that time. Um, How did you I meet met her? her? I met her at college, in undergrad. College. Um, and second year, we started dating. Mm-hmm. And uh, sophomore... And then um, we went together as boyfriend or girlfriend to SCAD, uh, Savannah. and For grad school. For grad school. And I did animation. They didn't have a modeling program, which is kind of weird. Really? They still don't. They have an ITGM program, but then you have to learn programming. Fuck that. Nobody wants to learn programming. Like, come on. I'm I'm starting to learn programming now, like on my own time, but it, it is unbelievably hard and it's just not worth my time. I was about to say, there's plenty of people yeah. who want to learn programming, but maybe just not going to art school. Exactly. Well, it was like a mixture. You had to do both. Well, although we actually happen to know somebody who went to art school for programming and he mm-hmm. is uh, working at our company and doing very well. Yeah. So yeah. Well, that's like one of the hardest jobs to be good at is, is a programmer in art, uh, I, f- I feel. Yeah, the... Yeah, you know, the, the artist who didn't have, a, let's just a straight modeling program either. You were either in animation or game art. 
Yeah, which is bogus because modeling allows for those other things to exist. Yeah, With, without it, those, you couldn't really, you know, without any of them, you can make a, an entire piece. Like you have to have all to make a thing, so they should support it. Yeah, I, I, I do kind of feel like s- there were some art. Artif- well, the places where the two programs should have differed, they shared classes, and the places where they could have shared them, they they put artificial. It was very strange. Yeah, it's definitely. So the whole time I was at SCAD, I was having to do all these animation stuff that I, it was fun. I like animation. I'm good at it, but it wasn't, wasn't one of what I wanted to study. So I was, all my free time was ZBrush, which I didn't have at home, the newer version. And so I would always be at school using their Cintiqs, trying to learn how to use it. Um, that was one of the beautiful things about SCAD when I first got yes. there too, was they were, they yeah, were Cintiqs. flush with the Cintiqs, at least in my fantastic. department. Yeah. Yeah. I think they had uh, like 400 Cintiqs when we started. Was, well, that was in Savannah, not in Atlanta. Yeah, it was nuts. I, I went to Atlanta, but uh, for grad school anyway. So yeah. it, I, I know I keep asking you to backtrack, but I'm, I'm thinking about that that uh, uh, summer between high school and college, and you were spending 18 hours a day learning how to model and do 3D art, and yet then you went and learned how to be a traditional sculptor and pottery maker. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah so, definitely. so I mean, what <laughs> is that? Why? Because, yeah. Why? I mean, what? What was? What was the motivation? I have there? no idea. Uh, they they had no computer stuff there. Um, okay. Fair enough. Fair and enough. The cost compared to Savannah and other colleges like that was way less, and my parents weren't going to be able to help me too much for mm-hmm. undergrad anyway. Mm-hmm. So, uh, just it, the price was worth what it was it was it was Mm -hmm. amazing um Mm -hmm. and really like i I feel like it actually in the long run was better than grad school actually because i was working with my hands and i was doing sculpture 24 7 where grad school was a lot of like very separate things that were pulling me every which direction and never get to focus on one thing uh and you then clearly it, still get a lot of joy out of doing physical sculpture too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I feel like it all feeds back into itself, definitely. So if I do traditional, it's going to feed back into the the computer and vice versa. Like I'm using the 3D printer now to print things out, and and I couldn't sculpt that well. Not it would take me four times longer to sculpt it traditionally. I just like sculpted it during lunch and started printing it before lunch was over. And then you've got your printer at work. Yes. Your personal printer. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's my, my 3d printer I bought about a year ago. Um, and, uh, a workmate of myself are using it together. Mm -hmm. He bought his own plastic. He bought his own tray to put the plastic in. And so we just hand it on, you know, move it over desk to desk. Oh, that's fun. Put Sounds like a, some nice camaraderie going on. Yeah, there. well, it, it makes it to where I'm like getting him like excited, and he's like, "Oh, I got to do something," and then mm-hmm. he does something, mm-hmm. and then I see what he's doing. Oh, I got to do something, and so I make something. And so it's one of the beautiful things about being in a studio versus yes. working by yourself in a studio. Although I, I, in your own studio, I mean, but I, I do miss aspects of working alone in my own, in my yeah. own space as well. It's nice, but it, it's also like you learn so much more being in inside of a place. Like I sucked at art when I got there and, and <laughs> being near people that are fantastic. Like you just, you get fantastic. If you're paying attention, if you're not paying attention, mm-hmm. I don't think anybody will learn. It just doesn't happen. But if, if you're paying attention to what they're doing and what you're doing and, and looking at the difference, you'll get good. Like it's awesome. So uh, backtracking again, uh, SCAD. SCAD. <laughs> uh, Awesome. Yeah, I like SCAD. Wait, wait, just, wait, wait, wait. That's not what you were saying earlier. No, so it's, it's good. It's definitely good. Give me good. the pros and cons. How about? Uh, you meet a lot of people, and that can help in the industry a lot. That's mm-hmm. awesome. And some of the teachers in it in Savannah were professionals that were there. Some weren't, which wasn't cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't. I don't think if you're if you haven't been in the industry, you shouldn't be teaching. I don't think that that's i mean it sucks for people that can't get into the industry they want to teach or something but it you you just don't know if you're teaching the right stuff Mm -hmm. like and and 
when people come to us from SCAD or whatever, they usually don't, unless they've taught themselves, they don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what was going on when I got in there. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Like, (laughs) it was a mystery. And, And really, like, within the first six months, I learned more there than I learned in four years by myself or with SCAD. Mm-hmm. So that, that does seem to be pretty typical, though. Yeah, um, yeah. I think it's with every every place. Yeah. Well, I'm not even with art. Like, um, I I'm in my second career. My first one, I um, I had no idea what I was a drafter. I had no idea what I was doing with my first job. I I basically learned how to do it on the job. Mm-hmm. All all school taught me was the um, I guess the software. Oh yeah. Yep. Know, yeah, that's what's how to make good lines at. with this, <clears throat> and yep. then the rest mm-hmm. of it I had to figure out on my own because that there's was, only so that, much I can do. Technically, that's why you go to SCAD or or any other art school is so that you have the technology that you can you can mess with. And if you're one of those guys that's going to get a job, you will spend the time to mess with it. Where other people go have parties, you'll be at work uh, at the school working. Sounds familiar. And mm-hmm. and doing, you know making your eyes bleed looking at the computer or in my case twitch they always i used to twitch I used to get an eye wiggle oh oh when you said twitch i'm thinking of the uh the online uh, no. yeah the video sharing. service no, the video no. service <laughs> no the the uh, offline eye twitching <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness um and how yeah. long how long did you suffer with that i it, it was on and off for like uh. a couple, couple years it would be like every couple months so i hope you get day. your eyes off of the computer enough so that, oh, that yeah, doesn't happen anymore yeah, i don't i don't i think i've been on the computer so much that it doesn't affect me anymore right. <laughs> <laughs> it's more like it i've built up a tolerance just to just to kind of pile on what jeremiah was saying i've actually experienced the same thing in unfortunately multiple careers including when i was in the navy i can tell you that in all of the training which was extensive um, very little of it translated directly to what I was doing once I got out on the mm-hmm. flight line. Yep. The training that I got once I hit, you know, boots on the ground, that's where I learned my job. Yep. And, um, and the same thing I, I can honestly say can be said about uh, a lot of the schooling, although a lot of the schooling that I've had uh, definitely did directly translate. But like you said, yeah. even to this day, I, I need to learn something new. It's on the Internet. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. You know, that's where I go. Uh, or, yes, someone that you know at work, yep. you know, who also Definitely. has a skill that you don't. I, yep. I will say that the, the one teacher I had who would spend half the class time each quarter basically yelling at us turned out to be the most accurate for what work was like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're not ready for this. You don't get this. You, uh, he was right. Yeah. He was absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, we, um, and what's sad is at, at, uh, at our studio, um, it's getting harder and harder to teach the new people because we're just always busy. So it's like ah. back in the day, like when we didn't have a whole lot going on, somebody could come sit with you and be like, this is how you do something. This is how you do it. This is how you do it. And now it's like, I'm responsible for, you know, getting a, a character done at the same amount of time that I was, you know, that, could be harder this, you know, because we're going a much higher level. So I I need all of that time and trying to take away from that time to go teach somebody how to do it makes it harder. It's definitely, and and luckily I haven't needed to do that for quite some time now. They've been letting me focus, but um, I think we're going to have to start teaching people again because there's quite a few new people. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Luckily a lot of them, I don't know what's going on, but the kids are getting much smarter. Okay. So, <laughs> well, there's all, there's all that That's information on the internet. I was right? going to yeah. say that it's what you were thing. saying before. Yeah. Um, so, so after you you got out of you left SCAD and then you basically had you said like a year working on multiple portfolios, multiple iterations yeah. of that. What what kinds of things were you learning? What sorts of sources were you? Where were you learning from? Um, okay. Uh, well, I mean, it, it, it's like information is everywhere, and a lot of it comes from places you wouldn't expect, and some of it doesn't have anything to do with what you're learning, and some of it is you know, very applicable, um, like the anatomy stuff. Like, it's not really, uh, like, you wouldn't think of it as a requirement for um, working in a game industry, but it is the most crucial thing there is. 
And so learning anatomy is a big thing and, and doing that really helps. Um, I, I didn't know much anatomy when I got to high res. Uh, I thought I did. And, uh, then I started actually learning it about a year and a half ago. Um, one of the other guys, the same guy that's working with me with the printer, uh, we decided to go on a journey and learn every point on the human skeleton. And we started buying um, skeleton parts from bone clones. And they take actual human skeleton and, and cast it. And uh, so it's like it has every little nook and cranny detail. And then we got an app on the phone that's called Visible Body. And it, you know, that and other things go over every single point on every single bone. And we took about a year and a half and learned it all. And wow. from that point for and sculpted the skull like 70 times and the, like every bone like four or five times. And uh, just we, we went balls to the wall on, on the skeleton. We haven't done the muscles yet. He's starting to learn the face a little bit. Um but I'm, I'm doing stuff besides that. I'll get to it eventually and learn the muscles in that kind of respect where it's just every single insertion origin and uh, interaction between the muscles and how they open and close. And, and how does, I mean, I love this stuff. <laughs> I love this stuff because I've, I've gone through that kind of journey myself before where I could name uh, every single point insertion, yeah. and every fascia on, on the bone structure and, and could name all most of the muscles and I know how that plays into what I've done for a living. How does that affect your daily process as a character artist for 3d games? It's, it's huge. Uh, being able to sculpt a person without ever thinking about what you're making, uh, speeds it up tremendously. I, I don't, I don't even have like a calculation of how much time it, it would speed up, but uh, it takes me less than 10 minutes to sculpt a skull now where, wow. you know, three, four hours to get something that's rough, you know, before I learn the skull. Uh, and like I, I made those, the lips that I showed, uh, like 15 minutes, like, holy it, cow, like literally it just, you just take a sphere and just sculpt it and you know it because you've already learned all of the points. Uh, the bones are really helpful for knowing, where they reach the surface on the skin. And so if you know that, then you have uh, what they call bony landmarks of where um, what that looks like and, and where they hit the surface. And you have a hard edge right there. And and then it helps you also with distances and and proportions and that kind of stuff, even though we, we go pretty wacky on the proportions. But mm -hmm. Uh, it still makes it more realistic. You, if, well, if you know what... Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, you have to know the rules before you can break them. Exactly. That's yeah. exactly what I was going to say. Because I've, yep. I've had so many conversations with people, often, you know, thinking back to like school, where it's like, oh, why do I need to know this? I'm making monsters. Yep. I'm like, <sighs> yep. this is why you're not going to make it. That's, yeah. <laughs> and for me, like, whenever I see monsters, unless I can see some of those principles in them, I just, next page. <laughs> I don't even look at it. Like it's just kind of when you're looking at portfolios, portfolios or just work online, like even professionals, I'll, I'll look at their stuff. Ooh, ugh. And what sucks now is now I know skulls. So any skull online, if it's not perfect, I know it I'm like instantly I'll, I'll look at it. And, oh, that, foramen. So it, that way, foramen doesn't look right. Oh God. In, in a way it kind of affects your appreciation for yes. art. You're looking for yeah. something finer now. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, other resources, just going to places that are 3D, like there used to be CG Hub. <laughs> Gone. Yeah. Uh, I use oh, Pinterest yeah. right now. A lot to, of people were really upset about that. To make so. boards and keep mm -hmm. reference. That's another thing is like reference is huge. Um, if, you do, if you haven't looked at reference to know what you're making, you're not going to make it. Mm -hmm. like, just, it's plain and simple. Um, and after you've done it like 15, 20 times, maybe then you can not look at reference a mm -hmm. little bit, but even then it's kind of silly not to have it up at least. Mm -hmm. Um, Matt core, uh, who started, oh, yeah. um, control paint.com. I'll give him a little shout out here. I watched one of his, uh, how to gather reference videos. And he literally said almost everything that you just said, it, it's the same thing. You really need to be specific when you're looking for, yeah. 
uh, the different types of rock or the different types of anything it is that you're trying to um, actually achieve in 3D or even in 2D painting. You know, yeah. even sculpting monsters having up a reference of like the specific texture that you want on that or the specific look to the weird creature that you're making. Like you find mm-hmm. a, a strange bug that looks alien and use it for the face or whatever. Um, that That's what makes things look realistic and feel good. Um, but yeah, a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, I started making more photorealistic things before I got into high res. Like I made a camera at one point and I tried to make my face at one point and, I think a lot of that kind of helped a lot because I was focusing on specific things and not, oh, I'm going to make a monster. Yeah. So, yeah. A lot of reference in books. I've got probably 100 books still. (laughs) Right. Even though the internet has it all. (laughs) Even though the internet has it all. uh, Yeah. yeah, Whatever. I still have the books. I think most uh, very dedicated artists still have that that, uh, library and books from 93. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I I uh, I always had this dream of having, you know, a, a big reference library and and art how to books library, and I have it now. You know, yeah. it's not as big as as some of the artists that I know, but uh, that's after actually the last eight years of I, I moved entirely too many times and started realizing, okay, if I'm not Gotta opening that book books. at least once or twice <laughs> a year, then it's mm. time to get rid of. And I think I got rid of, good God, nearly half of my books over the last eight years. Yep. You know. And added to it, of course, because there's way too many great art of books coming out from from great films that I yep. love. You know? Oh, that's one of the best trends of the the last oh, couple decades yeah. of yes. art books. Those are awesome. Yeah, yeah. It used to be like Star Wars was the only one that did that, or or so, at least that's what I, I was aware of when I was a kid. Now it's like every animated movie, most big movies, some little movies. They're doing it for games now. Oh yeah, yeah. I love it. I mean, your Journey, uh, uh, Deus Ex just put out one. Um, uh, Dishonored 2 is getting an art book. It's great. I wish we would do it. So, <laughs> we digress. But um, but digression is good. I think we've just, just decided. Um, so, is there anything that we haven't already asked that you'd love for people to know about you, what you do, or about getting into the job that you're in? Uh, that's actually what I was going to ask. If, if somebody <laughs> wanted to kind of follow... Your footsteps. You into, I mean, you know, there's a lot of openings at, at high res. There's other yeah. companies. You yeah. know, there are a lot of people looking eventually to get these jobs. What would you tell them? Uh, just work hard, really. Like, the, the harder that you work, the harder you get. Um, try to make stuff better and try to better yourself at every point. And, you know, make a project and then, like Dexter's Lab, throw it away and go to the next project kind of thing. Mm-hmm. you will get there closer and quicker. But if if you're just kind of mucking around in it and you want to do it as a hobby, it won't happen. Um, it's It's got to be full on, I'm going to do this, I'm going to learn all of the anatomy, I'm going to learn all of the techniques to use in 3D pipeline, all of it. Like just you have to... And you want to start asking people online how they did it and start... So which, you you say interaction with people in forums, yeah, things like that is very Yeah, I was bad about, but um, it's the best way. <laughs> it sounds like you were too busy doing the work. Yeah, apparently. Uh, but yeah, th- that's definitely the best way because you'll learn quicker. Um, I I learned all this stuff the hard way. I was like, like didn't even know what a normal map was until uh, grad school, and really they weren't a thing until about two thousand six or seven Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and right around that time uh they were still using object space and they were really cumbersome and hard to use and and in maya they didn't have support for any of them Mm -hmm. so you had to like make this weird wacky shader network to get it to work and uh, it was a nightmare so okay what about school i mean would you would you recommend to somebody knowing what you know now to go to school to get work no. <laughs> okay. Uh, I would recommend to find somebody that's already been in the industry and start bothering them, and hopefully they'll talk to you. That's a big hopefully. Yeah. That's a big hopefully. Uh, hopefully you'll push hard enough on your free time that they'll notice you and start talking to you. So when you say find someone, do you mean online? Like try to find a mentor yeah, on a I think forum? So. Like, yeah. Like and, and you so what was, your, uh, what was your email again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyways... Um, 
yeah, I, th- I think finding like go to poly count or CG hub. What or, is it? Wait, I don't know. CG hub doesn't don't, work anymore. Um, I don't know what uh, poly count is. So poly count is pretty much the uh, video game, uh, website to go to. I should know this. Yeah. Uh, go there or art station, or I think there's like, um, 10,000 is on Facebook. Uh, go to that and just start asking people and, and really like, it's good to know the, the nuts and bolts of it, but if your stuff looks good, it's going to matter more. So, and what about posting, posting your work? Oh man, that's always like a weird issue with me. Like seeing stuff that's whip and people are like posting it everywhere and you're like, don't post that. It looks so bad. Whip being work in progress. Yes. Uh, so you'd say, uh, to, to younger, younger listeners, maybe on the forums, it's fine, but don't, don't put it on LinkedIn or something. That's really or, or taste. on art, art station is so art, huge right now. Art I station love art is station. probably fine. You could probably put it on really? there because the feed is so fast on that. Cause that people might not see your stuff anyway, yeah. and you might get some comments or whatever. Uh, but some of the forums are better because you can ask somebody, hey, what should I do to this? Next. And then they will yeah. actually answer you. Or on ArtStation, it's more like, look at my artwork. It's so beautiful. And then it just gets run over by other artwork and uh, nobody ever sees it. So I kind of think that the forums are better. Go to Polycount. That's, that was pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, so find a mentor, work your butt off. Yeah, I think so. I think that would be better. Because the the loan debt is just not worth it. What about it's, um, what about conventions and shows? Oh, those are great. I, I was just at SCAD, uh, not SCAD, uh, Siege the other weekend, mm-hmm. and um, there's actually like really good people there. Where I've had like in the past, you go there and everybody is just really subpar, and you're you feel scared to talk to them, like you don't want to hurt their feelings, um, but. Everybody there was pretty decent, mm-hmm. so I didn't feel like I had to like crush anybody's dreams mm-hmm. or hopes. Were, were you part of? I'm assuming you're part of the um, the portfolio review. I did and a all portfolio that. review. Oh, I tried to get into that. Yeah, I want to crush people's. No, I don't. <laughs> um. Yeah, I I didn't have to. So whatever. So, but I mean, if you can answer this, I mean, is anybody getting hired from something like Siege by your company? Uh, there were a few people that we took a look at. Um, We'll see what happens because a lot of those positions are like up and then they're taken right away and then they're up and then they're taken right away. So, mm. and it, you know, Siege isn't the only place that we're looking. So, right, you may get like three or four people out of Siege, but they're up against a hundred people on right. the internet. So, right, and then we so you we guys interview do, them. You guys do find people on the internet a lot, and yeah. you contact them and say, yeah. "Hey, are you interested in?" Yeah, work? and so we also like people know friends, and mm-hmm. they're really good, and so you want a really good person over somebody that's new to the industry. Um, and then a lot of times our HR will find somebody. So we have, you know, like ten interviews where you're trying to figure out which one's best, and it's mainly the portfolio. So mm-hmm. just be kick ass. So bust your butt. Uh, put yourself out there, whether it be on the internet, whether it be at Siege or, or any number of other Something, shows. Yeah. And oh, I should probably uh, uh, specify Siege as the Southern Interactive Entertainment and Games Expo. Yeah, I put on by I the uh, put that <laughs> put on by the uh, Georgia Game Developers Association. It's a it's the kind of the southeast, and it takes place in game um, Atlanta, it, Marietta, wasn't it? Um, well, okay, it's just outside the perimeter, just north of Atlanta. It's, yeah, it's uh, like 75 and 285. It's like always oh, okay. in this, mm-hmm. um, what is it? It's it a Marriott. Is. Marriott, yeah. Yeah, well, the, the point is that, that Siege is a regional thing. Uh, it's you got GDC is the, the massive international one. It Siege is about a tenth the size. Uh, yeah, it's pretty small. But there's probably other conventions around the country, wherever you happen oh, yeah. to be. There's something, something equivalent to that, and most of them have... Um, less expensive passes for students or, or indie people, you know, people looking for jobs, uh, because the, the, that kind of networking is is yeah. extremely valuable. And a lot of them they do it online. Like you can watch the entire thing online. Mm-hmm. Like uh, just recently they had the ZBrush Summit, and you can watch industry people talking about what they do for you know f- like seventy two hours straight. They just talk, 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 talk about how they work at Pixar or they work at Pixelogic and 
help make the tool that you want to use, you know? Awesome. Mm -hmm. So sounds like something to take advantage of if it's there. Yeah. You should definitely look into that. One of the things that I, I want to bring up on this, I know I'm just kind of interjecting, but there's so many small companies out there that oh, yeah. are trying to make uh, mobile apps and that are trying to make small scale video games to be played on individual websites and things, yeah. things like that. You can go hunt and and work with some of these people. And obviously, a, a lot of people are going to want you to, and I do, I do not necessarily recommend this, but a lot of people are going to want artists, whether you be 2D or 3D, uh, to, hey, come work for me on spec or work with me on spec in return for a portion of the, the ownership if you're lucky. And that's probably one of the few cases where I'd even be willing to do it. Or for for so-called um, pay after the fact, which I would never recommend. Yeah, that's kind of scary. Um, so be, be careful <laughs> about that kind of stuff. But if, if you find a company that's small and hungry and and needs people, um, you you may not get the greatest pay in the beginning, but you'll you'll get paid in or not in, pay. Well, I like I say <laughs> I, I don't technically recommend to people to to work for no pay at yeah, all. I, I almost won't. never do, but I don't either. But I did. <laughs> you did so. Uh, did four months of that. Right, so that right. The fun. internship. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then that got me a contract, so mm-hmm. it worked. Oh, mm-hmm. It's fine. Um. Um, I, when I say, when I say don't work on spec, I'm talking about for some guy coming out of the woodwork. Oh yeah. You know, oh, yeah. No. Uh, who doesn't have any funding whatsoever. And, you know, is, is, you know, I, I mean, I even know a few developers, uh, meaning, um, um, you know, programmers, engineers who, uh, who they, they actively look for artists to work with them. Now, if you're excited about the work and you like the mm-hmm. person, sure, give it a shot. But if there's somebody who has no clue who you are and you don't know who they are and they, they just get oh, a hold yeah, of that you out of the blue, be messy. it can mm-hmm. be so ugly. And, and I just, I'd, I'd yep. say instead of that, go back home and continue working on your own projects. Yep. Definitely. You know? Yeah, I, I know people have been burned on stuff like that before. Way yep. too often. Yeah. 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 And well, you, com- get, you get burned artists. out too. Like not yeah. just burned, but, but burned, burned out. out. Yeah. Like and, and you, they'll work you to the bone for nothing. And then you're like, oh, I don't feel like doing art ever yeah. again. And I, I know a <laughs> lot of illustrators and comic book artists who get hit up in that way all the time by would-be writers who, who say they've got the best thing since sliced bread. And, and mm. of course they mm-hmm. don't, you know. But you get exposure. Oh. Exposure, Pat. Exposure bucks. Exposure, yeah. Have you guys yeah. heard that? Exposure yes. bucks. Yes, yes. Yeah. We're gonna be. We're gonna pay you an exposure. I'm sorry. Box. The the yeah. company that owns my mortgage does not accept exposure. Yeah, box. exactly. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. All you right. can pay um, them directly, please. Yeah. <laughs> On a serious note, I, I want to give you my sincerest thanks for being our first guest. Yeah. On uh, on Creator Forge. Uh, this has been absolutely amazing and super, super informative. And I'm pretty sure that everybody listening who's interested in getting into game art, especially on the 3D side, is going to be really interested in what you had to say. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. Hopefully they will use it. <laughs> Hopefully. Take it to heart, please. All right. Yeah, so that was our, our um, interview with uh, David Riddle. Uh, I wanted to thank him again for for being our, our guinea pig for these <laughs> interviews and uh being willing to talk to us at all uh i think it went great yeah and david i just wanted to say one more time thank you so much for being our first interviewee uh, i really appreciate it and i think that a lot of people are going to get a lot of use out of the information that you provided thank you so much Please join us for episode three, Getting to Know Creator Forge, where I interview my co-host, game producer Jeremiah Clark, and delve into his art education and learn how he made the transition into creative project management in a studio environment. CreatorForge.com is still under construction, but please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, or wherever you find podcasts. You can also follow Creator Forge on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and just about everywhere else on the web. Please feel free to leave us comments and feedback at any of those locations. We would love to hear your thoughts and suggestions. If you enjoy our show, please consider supporting us on Patreon. This will help us cover the many costs associated with creating this podcast, like equipment, hosting fees, and much, much more. Also, we will occasionally release additional podcast material that will only be available on Patreon. Thank you for your support, and thank you for listening.